Hey, good evening, everybody. It's uh, my great pleasure to welcome you here tonight. This is an event that would traditionally take place in person in Kingston, and that's where I am now. So I wanted to begin by uh, recognizing that in a remote setting like this, the audience may be connecting from a variety of locations. And I encourage you, especially if you're from outside Kingston, to put a note in the chat telling us where you are from, and if you know, who were the tr traditional inhabitants of that territory. For those of us like me who are in Kingston, we're situated on the traditional Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territories. I am an uninvited guest on those territories, but grateful for the opportunity to live and work on these lands. Personally, uh, my wife and I are lucky to have an undeveloped property 40 minutes north of Kingston. It's a beautiful location. And in fact, that's a picture uh, in the background of, a, of our property, surrounded by woods, by water, by rocks, and it's teeming with animals. And I often sit on these rocks late at night underneath the starry skies. You can hear the howls of the coyotes and imagine that for tens of thousands of years, other occupants would have come and enjoyed this space and had very strong connections to the land and the water and how that we now have the responsibility to protect the health of that land. And I encourage you all to think about your land and your connection and your responsibilities. So uh, tonight we're gonna to be talking about research at Queen's and the purpose of the Ignite series was really to bring together members of the public and researchers at Queen's to have an engaging evening where the public can learn more about some of the fascinating research that's happening at Queen's. And how this is enabled by the students who are working on the projects and doing most of the work and how this has interesting and important consequences for the greater community and the greater society. So it's an evening where we introduce some of the science and we hope for a lot of engagement by the audience. We encourage everyone to get uh, really engaged in the question and answer session and so you're able to put things into the chat. Whatever your question, we're open and it should be a fun and educational part of the evening. So I'll take this moment now just to introduce Mark Richardson. Mark is our education and outreach officer at the McDonald Institute. He has a PhD in astrophysics and is passionate about outreach. Uh, Mark will be moderating the question and answer part of the evening and I'll invite him to say a quick word now. Yeah, thanks a lot, Tony. I just want to encourage everybody to uh, put your questions as you listen to tonight's talks in the comment box, and I'll be able to read those and, and ask some of our speakers those questions. So thanks a lot and enjoy. Right. So although our focus at the McDonald Institute is on particle astrophysics, and you'll hear a bit about that tonight, the Ignite series is really working with Queen's throughout the series to highlight the research activities and the achievements of both our faculty and our students. Uh, so it really is a partnership. It's not about astroparticle physics alone, although we always try and get a little bit of a, uh, an element of that in as partners with Queens, but we're really trying to highlight the excellence of the research and the important consequences of it. To the younger members in the audience, we're really looking forward to the days when you <laughs> are the research students that we're profiling in this series. So I'm really intrigued about the topics for this evening and the subtle ways in which cross-disciplinary work connects into astroparticle physics and also how astroparticle physics techniques can be applied to current problems such as the COVID pandemic. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker that's Matt Laybourne. And so I'm delighted to introduce Matt Laybourne. He's a professor of physics, or sorry, <clears throat> a professor of geology in the Department of Geology. And he's also a member of the McDonald Institute. Sorry, Matt. Matt, originally hailing from New Zealand, obtained his BSc in New Zealand in uh, Wakatu. You'll correct me on the pronunciation. And his master's in science from Acadia University. And that's important because that's where he uh, first got his in inherited some maritime blood, important for everyone in Canada. He received his PhD in 1998 from the University of Ottawa. Then he continued his career in geology over many exciting positions with research spanning the globe, all the way from the exotic locations of uh, Bathurst, New Brunswick to New Zealand. And he's worked in government, industry and university settings with a focus on hydrothermal processes. 
rare earth elements and new applications in isotopes, both in geology, but also in other fields, including astroparticle physics, epidemiology, and the environment. He's currently the co-director of the Queen's Facility for Isotopic Research and a member of the McDonald Institute. So Matt's going to speak to you about hydrothermal systems and how that connects into the origins of life. And then he will introduce uh, Charlotte McConto, who will talk about her, her research, which is connected to this. So I'll pass it over to you, Matt. Great, thanks, Tony, and uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to, to this uh, very interesting evening. I'm gonna share my screen here, and we'll get started. Right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how I got started in, in geology. And just very briefly, uh, as Tony mentioned, my, my journey to, to Queens and to astroparticle physics is very long and convoluted. So I'm gonna short circuit it by way of the oceans. Um, just for context, what we're looking at in the, in the videos behind or on the screen there, these are images from a volcano just offshore of New Zealand called Tipuia. Ofakari, which is the Maori name for, for what Pakeha people call White Island. Uh, these videos were taken uh, when I was there a few years back. Unfortunately, you can't go there anymore because some people died uh, just about a year ago uh, when it erupted and so there were tourists on, on the island. But anyway, so this is sort of the, gives you the, the starting point of my journey in in geology in, in general, but, but my interest in hydrothermal systems in particular. And so to give you the, the context of, of New Zealand, or as, as it's more properly known, Aotearoa, which in Maori means the land of the long white cloud. So you can see New Zealand's here at the top of the globe. Um, and, um, and coming to the, from your perspective, the the southwest, or if you're in New Zealand, I suppose you'd call it the northeast, but there's a long line of undersea volcanoes. And that's, and that's where I spent a lot of time uh, doing some research. And so as a, as a young person, I grew up in a city called Auckland, which is the largest city of New Zealand. And on the right hand side here, you can see this is just a, a very crude outline map of New Zealand, oh, sorry, of Auckland. Um, but what you can notice there is that there's a huge number of volcanoes that, where the largest city in New Zealand sits right on top of. Uh, this one here, Rangitoto, uh, last erupted about 800 years ago. That's the most recent eruption in the, in the Auckland volcanic field. And this image at the bottom here is an image you would see from almost any beach uh, in the Auckland area, Rangi, and that's Rangitoto in the backdrop. Uh, you can go hiking there, it's just an incredible place. But as a, as a young man growing, well, as a boy growing up, you know, this is the, a constant reminder of, of, of where New Zealand sits, which the image on the left shows, New Zealand sits right along a plate boundary, right? So New Zealand separate, is on the boundary that separates the Pacific plate to the east to the Austra from the Australian plate to the west. And so to the northeast of New Zealand, from, from this perspective, you have subduction, that is the the oceanic plate of the Pacific plate is being shoved underneath the Australian plate. And this is what leads to all the volcanoes and the hydrothermal activity. The star there is uh, Fakari or Wet Island. So it's just off the coast of New Zealand. And so what's, what's really amazed me, I was thinking in putting together this talk is that, is that my, my interest and passion for this kind of work has taken me from the depths of the ocean. So, so the image on the top left, that's a little starfish for scale and uh, sitting on top of some lava flows. But this is a, just offshore of New Zealand um, and it's at 4.2 kilometers water depth. So these are fairly young volcanic rocks that have erupted in a very deep basin to the Northeast of New Zealand. The image on the top right again is back on Fakari. That's myself sitting there taking notes uh, and a colleague. We are actually sampling the crater lake of that volcano. Um, no longer allowed, um, perhaps not the smartest thing to have done, but we had to monitor the chemistry of the waters to try and determine when it was gonna erupt again. So I've gone from the very depths of the, of the, of the oceans to, to sea level volcanoes. Uh, and the bottom left is uh, sitting on top of some rocks in the, in the Yukon, uh, I forget what, 
elevation, a couple of thousand meters, sitting on some volcanic rocks that would have formed in a very similar environment uh, some 400 million years ago. And the image on the bottom right is, it's hard to see, but there's some steam there. So it's a geothermal spring, uh, which we sampled just last uh, November at about four, four kilometers elevation in the high Andes. Um, so we were sampling geothermal waters there. So, so really this is an interest in waters that extends from the bottom of the air, well, bottom of the oceans to the, to the top of the mountains. So what are we really interested in when we're in the, in the kinds of research that I do in terms of hydrothermal systems and the origin of life? And really what we're looking for is we're looking for these things here. And these structures are called chimney structures and they're made up of a variety of minerals. But in some cases, these minerals are uh, rich in some of the metals that we now mine on land. And so when you think of the big mining camps in the world, such as the Bathurst, mine, Bathurst mining camp in New Brunswick, those deposits uh, of copper, lead, zinc, gold, etc., originally formed on the sea floor. In the case of New Brunswick, about 460 million years ago. Um, the one on the right here, you can see, has got this plume of, of we call it a black smoker. It's not really smoke. What it is is, is metal sulfide minerals precipitating as the, in this case, these fluids are 300 degrees C, highly acidic, and they're entering into the ocean at about two degrees C, uh, pH of about seven and a half. So we've got highly acidic, metal rich waters, high temperature mixing with the surrounding, surrounding seawater. And so these are the things that we are trying to find on the sea floor to try and understand a variety of things such as how do ore deposits form, but, but more fundamentally, how, how did life perhaps evolve on planet earth? So how do we find these things? They're really, you know, this chimney here is just a couple of meters tall, sitting on the, in the middle of the ocean. It's, it's a tricky task. So we have to use a lot of chips and chips are very, very expensive to run. These are just four vessels that I've been on. The one on the bottom left is the, uh, is the Tangaroa, which is one of the New Zealand research vessels. On the upper left is the Zana, which is a German ship. The upper right is the Natsushima, which is a Japanese research vessel. And the one on the bottom right is, uh, is the uh, Urania, which is a, uh, an Italian uh, research vessel. Uh, of all the countries, vessels I've been on, the Italians have the very best chefs, I have to say. And so how, does the, how do these hydrothermal systems work? Well, it's really amazing. So, so these are volcanically active areas. In other words, we have to have a supply of magma. Hence, so we have magma down here in this very crude model. And the magma is hot. These are, these are parts of the mantle coming up towards the, the, the surface of the, uh, of, the, of the earth. So we're in seawater. So seawater percolates down through the rocks and it gets heated up by the high temperature of the magma. And in doing so, we take seawater and we convert it to, to very high temperatures uh, and we change its composition to become metal rich. And as these fluids then exit to the sea floor in our black smoker fluid, they then liberate out a whole variety of things such as carbon dioxide, hydrogen sulfide, which is the rotten egg smell you might've smelled in, in, in your life, methane, iron, manganese, and in particular, an isotope called helium isotopes, which are very diagnostic of having come from the mantle. Okay, so, so in a sense, what we, we're, the ocean is our haystack. The black smoker is the needle and we need to find the needle in the haystack. And so what this plume does is it gives us a much bigger thing to search for. And we do that using a device called uh, a CTD. And basically it's just a fancy way of, of saying we have a, a variety of devices on here that measure conductivity and temperature and depth and allow us to collect seawater samples. And we drag this behind the ship in an up and down motion called a toyo. And that lets us map, lets us map out where the hydrothermal plume. So you can see there's a change in color here in this caldera, and that's mapping out the hydrothermal plumes. And so we've done that for the entire uh, uh, New Zealand waters to the northeast of New Zealand, going from White Island all the way just north of a volcano called Manawai, which I'll show you in a second. So that's about 1,300 kilometers of, of arc length just right above the subducting slab. And what you see is a whole bunch of volcanoes 
Most of them are submarine. There's a few that stick out above sea level, but most of them are submarine. And where you see these red dots, these are based on these toyos, is where we've determined there's hydrothermal activity. And something like 70% of these volcanoes are actively hydrothermally venting uh, today. So it's an incredible percentage of these volcanoes are producing these high temperature fluids. So I'm gonna take you into a, a volcano, which is called Manawai. It's to the Northern end of New Zealand waters where the star is here. So White Island or, or Fakari is down in here. The upper right shows what Manawai looks like. It's actually a deep caldera. And that caldera is about eight kilometers in, in, uh, in diameter. It's a very large caldera. And then just outside the caldera is a large cone. So the caldera is in about 1600 meters water depth and the cone comes to within hundred meters of the sea surface. And on the bottom right here, you can see these plumes or these vent fluids that we've mapped with these toyos. And what it shows is that inside the caldera, there's a massive plume. There's also plumes coming off the top of the volcano. In fact, it was essentially erupting when we, when we took, these, uh, took these analyses. So what happens when we go down and look into the caldera? Well, we see some amazing things like here's uh, some, again, some volcanic rocks. So these are lava flows. In this bottom right, in the, in the bottom panels, you can see some crabs, which are fundamentally associated with, with hydrothermal fluids. And there's a whole bunch of shrimp. These are vent associated shrimp. So it's just teeming, these lava flows are teeming with this stuff. The other things we see are large mounds of Bethymodiolus uh, 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 bivalves. So these are extremely large mounds and this entire system is fed by hydrothermal fluids. Sitting on top of the mounds, you can see crabs and anemone and lots of shrimp and so forth. And you see other critters down there like octopus and, uh, and uh, uh, jellyfish and things like that. So again, this is at about 15, 1600 meters water depth. Really cool at Monoai. It's one of the few places in New Zealand waters where you see tube worms. These are not the classic tube worms that you see on the Galapagos. I'll show you a picture of that in a minute, but these are nevertheless tube worms. This is what they look like when you bring them up to surface. Um, but you can see that these are associated with these crabs uh, and the bivalves. And then we also can find hydrothermal vents. So there's a vent here, um, there's a vent here, and what you see here, it, the yellow stuff is molten sulfur. It was molten sulfur. So coming out of these vents are high temperature fluids uh, and in, in some cases, liquid sulfur. I'm just gonna show you a video now from, uh, from a uh, volcano actually in the, in the Mariana Arc um, called Aikafu or something like that. And what you're seeing here is you're seeing a lot of hydrothermal venting but you can also see a lot of bubbles floating by. And what those bubbles are is liquid CO2. It's really an amazing system. All of these bubbles, that's liquid CO2 coming out of the system. And so this is, this is actually fundamentally important to the whole generation of life on these hydrothermal systems. Anyway, spectacular. And so, I'm not gonna go into these diagrams in great detail, but basically what, the, what, what the, the upshot of these systems are is that they are so deep, they range in sort of typical depths from 1500 meters or so down to uh, over four kilometers they've been found. They're well away from photosynthetic activity. And so all life at the surface of the earth and down to roughly 100 to 200 meters below the sea surface, Life is fundamentally driven by sunlight, by photosynthetic reactions. And that's what's shown in this upper panel. In these deep seafloor systems, it's not photosynthetic. It's an entire ecosystem driven by what's called chemosynthesis. Okay, so the chemosynthesis is fundamentally related to the hydrogen sulfide and the methane being expelled by these hydrothermal fluids. And it's the oxidation or the change from hydrogen sulfide to sulfate and then back to sulfide or from methane to CO2 and back that drives, it provides the energy for the entire food web that exists down in these systems. And the map on the upper right here just shows that these submarine volcanic systems are all over the earth's oceans. And so we've really only scratched the surface. We found a lot of these systems 
uh, ranging upwards of 420 degrees C in temperature. But we still have a lot to, a lot to discover down there. And so here's just a few more images. The bottom right is the more classic uh, tube worm image that you may have seen from uh, images of the Galapagos Ridge. The video that's playing just is from the Monoai volcano, just showing some of these amazing, these hairy crabs and these shrimp and the bivalves, all fundamentally associated with these hydrothermal fluids. On the upper right here, again, we can see a very metal rich, high temperature, 350 degrees C black smoker fluid. So the plume is all metal sulfides. The one on the top left is actually a, quite a different system. In this case, it's an alkaline system. Um, so there's a lot of CO2 and methane uh, generated in these systems, but the chimneys are made out of a mineral called anhydrite, which is a calcium sulfate mineral. And so on the black smoker, the pH of those fluids is typically two to three. On the white smokers or the, the the alkaline systems, the pH is as higher as 10 to 11, that sort of thing. And so if we, if it, you know, there's been a lot of speculation that, that we, because we've got this entire ecosystem driven by non-photosynthetic reactions, so we don't need plants, we don't need chlorophyll, all we need is, is magmatism and, and water to drive a, a hydrothermal system, a circulating hot water system. And so that leads to the question, well, does, is this the kind of environment that we might think would exist on other planets? Uh, let's see, here we go. And so in fact, this is what's postulated uh, for, for the moon Enceladus. I'm sure I'm, I'm not doing justice to the name, but this, this is a moon uh, that has, uh, if I remember correctly, I think it's around Saturn, but forgive me if I'm wrong. But it's, it's, it's been shown to have these vents popping out into space through its icy crust. And so the idea is, is that there's hydrothermal vents at depth because there's a postulated to be an ocean underneath its icy crust. And so this is likely to be the place where if we wanna find life on other planets, this is where we should go and look. Don't see the moon slide? Well, now. Don't see Enceladus? That's weird. Hmm. How about, do you see? Hmm. I should be, should see. All right, let me try this. Yeah, I did that. Can you see it now? Okay, that's unfortunate. All right, let's try opening that again. Okay, that makes sense. Apologies. Okay, how about now? Maybe. Okay, all right, apologies for that. There's Enceladus. Uh, and you can see a little cartoon at the bottom left here showing uh, the hydrothermal vents or the, the theorized hydrothermal vents. Very sorry about that. Okay, so my final slide, hopefully you can see this, is to try and bring all of this back to my work here at the McDonald Institute. So I have a series of images here, just sort of to bringing together some different ideas. And so on the on the top left is a, is a it's a new, brand new uh, instrument that we just installed. It just started analyzing last week um, and in, in the QFER laboratory. And this was purchased with, with funds uh, from the Canadian government through the McDonald Institute. And what this device allows us to do is to measure things down to extremely ridiculously low detection limits. And so part of the reason we're doing that is in support of Snow Lab and the McDonald Institute because what we really wanna be able to do is to measure things like uranium and thorium and lead and radium, things that will interfere with the physics experiments that are taking place at two kilometers depth at Snow Lab. So the images here in the middle are just 
different kinds of radioactive decay. Uh, the details aren't really important, but these are the kinds of things that we're trying to either have not happen, i.e. uranium decay, or to try and determine what does happen, which is the, the image with the two red dots. And I guess the image on the bottom is, is, from, uh, is from Argentina up in the high Andes where we sampled last year. But that's just to remind us that you know, Snow Lab exists in a, in a deep mine. So this is where we get lots of metals from that mine. Um, you know, we need to take care of the environment for sure. Um, sadly, we also need to keep extracting metals. And the question is, can we do that responsibly, which is also part of my work. And that leads me to the final image, which is in the top middle here, which Charlotte, my PhD student will recognize because this is the university in, in uh, South Africa where she did her PhD. Um, and that was really my segue into introducing to, to Charlotte who is from this town, um, uh, Polokwane in uh, in Limpopo region of South Africa, and I will and I will stop there. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, I was saying thank you for the intro, Matt, and. Um... Yeah, um, I think he has mentioned that I'm Charlotte and he's shown uh, where I have done my undergrad. Um, I've done it in uh, South Africa in a university called Limpopo. It's in the northeastern part of South Africa. So um, I guess I'll just be sharing my screen to, to talk about my presentation. Yeah, 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 I got it. I was trying to to get my presentation. Uh, everybody can see that, right? Okay, good. Well, um, well, I'm Charlotte again. And then um, um, my talk today is on using geology to search for ways of detecting that matter. But before we get into the technical part, I'll just uh, try, try to tell you a short story on how I got to pursue geology as a career. So I grew up in a small town in South Africa. Um, this town has more than 10 operating mines and the primary commodities that are being mined are platinum and chrome. So the whole story is that um, in the late 90s to the early 2000s, there was a boom in uh, new mining operations which were opened. So basically what had happened was that there was a lot of blasting, there were a lot of movement of trucks, you know, or from and to the mining areas. So that sparked my curiosity on what was going on in the mines or what is going on so being from a South Africa with limited uh, internet connection, I went to a small, uh, our nearby library and back then they were using encyclopedia books. So that's when I researched about what is done at mines. I know yes, these uh, metals that are being extracted, but then what do they do exactly? So that's how I got to know about geology and I fell in love with it then. So I'm actually still pursuing it now. So that's my story on geology. So, um, so as a PhD student, what I'm doing basically is research. And my research is based in, uh, in the Bushveld Ignis complex, which is located in South Africa. It is one of the largest layered mafic, ultramafic intrusion in the world. And this complex, um, more, more than 50% of the world's platinum is actually extracted within the Bushveld deposit. So the location of my study area is in the Northern Limp, this uh, in the Northern Limp, and is actually in the pr uh, province called Limpopo, if we could see at the insert map, map on the, 
upper right. So I've mentioned that as a PhD student, I'm basically doing research. So my current research project is actually to assess whether we can use geology. In this case, we can use olivine or galena minerals to detect that matter. So the rationale behind using olivine and galena is that they are readily available in the upper crust, uh, middle to the upper crust, and they are available in South Africa in the Bushwell Ignis complex. So it's easier to extract them or to get to sample these, um, these uh, rocks or minerals. And also, uh, trace elements are moderately to highly incompatible with uh, these uh, uh, minerals. So we, that means that we would not have a lot of trace amounts of radioactive metals within these uh, minerals. So this is actually uh, examples of some of the rocks or backscattered images of some of the, my samples. On the left is a backscattered image of Danite thick section, where else on the right we have um, a Galena uh, thick section. The red markings are areas of interest wherein we want to analyze whether this is indeed a, uh, is indeed a, a Danite or is it indeed um, an olivine or maybe it's other minerals before we take this to further analysis. Same applies to the Galena on the right. So the other things that I'm doing or I will be doing in my PhD is that I'll be doing a um, selenium and tellurium isotopic work, mainly because the selenium and tellurium are proposed to have double, uh, double, uh, double beta, double, to have neutrino double beta decay. And also um, Matt has mentioned a lot about life and the oceans. So I'll also be doing um, assessments of uh, independent uh, mass independent sulfur, which relates to the fundamentals in the oxygen levels in the Earth's atmosphere. So besides being in the labs doing analysis and research, uh, the other things that geologists do is do field work. This field work involves mapping and also going in the, into the field to collect samples which you will later take to the lab to do analyses. So, which is exciting to do that. And you get to travel to access these samples. The other exciting thing about it is that you do a lot of mine visits. This is a mine in South Africa called Mokala Gwena, and it uh, primarily mines platinum, uh, but then nickel and copper are mined as uh, byproducts. And on the right is actually a picture of me with the senior geologist uh, with, with the senior geologist at that mine. The other and the most exciting thing about geology is that the world becomes narrow with time, especially when you do research. You get to travel to share your research, what you are doing, and you get to interact with other geologists who are doing maybe the same research or something different, but then we share ideas on this, uh, all the questions that we have about the, these rocks. So this is a picture of me where in uh, 2018, I, I had an opportunity to present some of my master's work at the PDAC conference. It's held each year in Toronto around March, early March. The other conference that I was fortunate to go to is SGA conference, which was held in 2019 in Glasgow. So this is uh, post the presentation. I was actually summarizing some of the work that I did for my master's, which was mineral chemistry of sulfides. This is my favorite picture of all time. I actually have it framed in my, uh, in my apartment. This is the, the Wager and Brown workshop. It was held in South Africa in 2018, where in Geologists over, all over the world, they came to meet and to share their ideas on their research, what they are doing along with their students. So professors, people from the industry got together to, to talk geology and to share ideas. So, and also 
it also shows that geology is fun because not everybody is all about is stiff or, you know, very, yeah, they are stiff, but they're very excited about what is going on and what is being done to solve all the questions we have up in the world. So that is me where, where there's a small error. That is a picture of me and I was actually near uh, some of the geologists uh, that I've like some of the, the, the people that I've been reading journal articles of. It was very exciting to meet them, to see the face to the papers of what I've been reading for my masters. So in closing, I would like to say that uh, since in this case, I've mentioned that we'll be using geology to, to, to search, search for ways to detect dark matter. So one would think that dark matter is something that is only related to physics, right? But then this research would actually show that scientific disciplines are not independent but then they can be used uh, simultaneously to answer all these questions that we have about um, the world or how the earth works and how, what existed before. So, and lastly, geology as a career, it's, it's exciting. It involves a lot of traveling. It involves, it involves a lot of traveling, being in the lab and just sharing ideas and answering all the questions we have in the world. So, yeah. Thank you. I will stop sharing my screen. Cool, thank you so much, Charlotte and Matthew. There's been a number of questions in the uh, in a little bit of discussion that was in the in the chat and some other questions that have come in. So one was um, for you, Matt, and it's actually from Tony. <laughs> I guess he's engaging <laughs> on YouTube as well. Um, and that is the DNA from chemosynthetic organisms a close match to their photosynthetic kind of counterparts. Um, I'm going to pass on that question because I'll be honest, I've not studied the DNA specifics of these critters. I, I'm, sadly, it's a huge gap in my training. I'm an inorganic geochemist. The organic geochemistry, uh, yeah, I sure wish I had done more on that. <laughs> if, I was a young, if I was a young man, which I'm not, uh, and doing this all over again, organic geochemistry where the, is where the action is for that kind of stuff, for sure. Sorry, mm -hmm. Tony. <laughs> There's another question, just wondering if there's, th these, these volcanoes are very unique about being underwater. Um, is, there, is there anything like equivalent to this, that, like studies that can be done for volcanoes above the water? Is there something unique about those environments? Well, so the, so the yes and no. I mean, it, it, what's, what's different about the submarine volcanoes is that, as the name implies, they, they are have a, a, their overburden, if you like, or what sits above them is seawater. Mm -hmm. And that induces, you know, lots of, there's a lot of hydraulic pressure or water pressure forcing water down into the rocks to get heated up. But it also means it's a very different, seawater is a very different water chemistry than you would get, say, in the high Andes. So in the high Andes, we certainly have geothermal fluids, which are just the above, above sea level equivalent to hydrothermal fluids. So it's the same phenomena, but the, the original water is quite different. It's meteoric water, which then gets heated up by, still heated up by magmas. The other difference would be the magma composition, but that's less important probably than the difference in the seawater composition. Mm -hmm. But what's amazing is that those, those tube worms and those chimney structures, you can go back in geologic time for hundreds, thousands of millions of years and see similar structures. So these things have existed so even though the, these, volcan these systems are very short-lived, they might live for a few thousands to a few tens of thousands of years, they, they, as, a, as a species or as a, a life form, they go back many, many millions. Yeah, hmm. it's very cool. Yeah, I'm just encouraging people that are watching, um, feel free to enter any questions you have for either Matt or Charlotte. Uh, there was another question, which is um, why, I know you said you're not an organic 
geologist, but uh, I'm curious if you can speak to it all, like why there's so much life around these areas? Like what what draws that life there? What makes it a very good ecosystem for the, all that kind so, of diversity of life? Right, so I'll answer it as best as I can. And, and, and really it's, it's, you've got an energy source. So wherever you've got an energy source and then some kind of food supply, life, life will find a way to exist. And so in this case, in, in these systems, those hot fluids are carrying a variety of, of, of elements that are very sensitive to the amount of oxygen, all right? So if there's no oxygen around, sulfur will form a hydrogen sulfide. And when it, those fluids are expelled to the sea floor, the oceans are oxygenated, at least in the modern world they are. And so they, they will no longer, they're no longer stable as sulfide and they want to change their oxy, oxygenation to become sulfate, which is a, a different form of sulfur. And, and that provides an energy source for microbes. And the microbes feed on that energy source and other life then comes along and says, aha, microbes, here's a food supply. And that drives the whole system to making long chain complex organic molecules and things like that. But it's fundamentally rooted in a chemical process rather than a sunlight process. And the last question I saw that was related to the, the volcanoes was in, they were interested about the, the possible volcanoes on Enceladus, excuse me, or other, other moons. Is there any plan to, to explore those environments to see if possibly those, you know, are there equivalent of black smokers there and maybe, maybe life? Yeah, unfortunately, I don't have, I don't have insights into the inner workings of NASA and, and I sure wish I did because if they were going to send a mission and they wanted a geologist, I would be, I would go there in a heartbeat, even if it was a one-way trip. Uh, it, it would just be so amazing to see. Yeah. Yeah. I, yes. People have thought about this. There's actually a movie not too long ago. I forget what it was called, a quasi horror movie, but where they land on one of the moons and, and- I think it's Europa Report, right? It could be, it could be. Anyway, and they all die because some crater that comes out of a hydrothermal vent below the ice. So, <laughs> so yeah. But, but what's interesting is a colleague of mine, uh, Bob Stern, he's at, uh, he's at the University of Texas at Dallas and he actually published a paper recently that, that he said that if we want to find intelligent life, we need to find a planet with plate tectonic, with modern type plate tectonics, that is subduction mm -hmm. and seafloor spreading. And all that. So, so it's not just, we can find volcanoes. If you, have, if you have magmas, you'll have hot water and you will produce hydrothermal vents. But his view is that in order for that to evolve to intelligent life, you need to find a planet with, with plate tectonics. The only problem I have with that is I'm not all that convinced that there's intelligent life necessarily on this planet, sometimes, sometimes not. I'm being facetious, but, but it's a really intriguing thing, right? Do we, what kind of, because we're the only planet in our solar system that has plate tectonics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a question for Charlotte. Uh, what is the signal you are looking for in the olivine um, that would be indicative of dark matter? Charlotte, I think your video is off and your camera's off if you're, if you're still available to answer questions. Um, cool. Charlotte, I think you're on mute still. Sorry about that. Um, well, okay, olivine is uh, one of the first minerals to, to crystallize in the magma, right? And they are available, like I mentioned, they're available in the upper to like the middle crust, the middle part of the crust of the earth. And what I am doing right now is actually working to, um, I have thanite samples which contain 90% or more than 90% olivine minerals. Mm -hmm. So what I'm doing, currently doing is actually assessing uh, uh, confirming the minerals within the darnite, if whether it is indeed olivine or its other like minerals. And then what I'll be doing, I'll be taking that to uh, electron probe microanalysis to see if they, cause it has lower detection. So to see if there are other things that I might have not seen using the SCM, right? So it's a whole process. I can't say what I, 
what signals I would met will help me on that. But then I know the geochemistry part for now, what I have done or what I will be doing. So yes, I'm sorry about that, Tony. Matt could uh, nope. no, no. that's so 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 the idea is so the, the idea is to use olivine or galena as what's called a or being termed a paleo detector. Yeah. So snow lab so, so, so to measure things like dark matter, you either need a really, really big detector yeah. or lots and lots of detecting material, which is what's, what Snow Lab represents, or you could have a very small detector and have it sit around for a really long time. And so the idea is that if an olivine crystal has sat around for 500 million years or a billion years or 2 billion years, it may have radiation damage that is indicative of the dark matter interaction with that mineral. And so what Charlotte's trying to do is to show that olivine is a good candidate mineral because it can sit around at high pressures and temperatures for a long period and has very low uranium. And that's really what she's trying to show is it has such low uranium and thorium contents that, that we can account for proximal or, or in situ radiation damage and maybe then back that out to see something that's extraterrestrial, if you like. Yes, and to add on to that, um, the Bushveld in this complex, it's more than, uh, it's two, uh, 2,054 million years old. So that means it's actually in the age range that uh, Mesh, Matt is mentioning right, mentioning right now. Um, yeah. And the very last question, and then I think we'll, we'll thank you again, um, is Matt, maybe this is mostly for you, but maybe Charlotte, you have something to add. Um, which is what are you most excited to test next with your new instrument at the, the QFIR? Oh my, that's a great question. So, yeah, so, so I'm, I'm fundamentally an isotope geochemist. And so really what I'm excited about is, is to try and find new ways to measure different isotopes at really low detection limits, but at, at, much more uh, rapidly and and with with less sample handling and so forth. And I know that doesn't sound very exciting, but it it opens up all kinds of research avenues. Because um, traditionally, for things like environmental research or mineral exploration or 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 even uh, ultra trace determinations for for astroparticle physics, and people have focused on the elemental composition. That is how much uranium is in there. And, and what we're interested in saying is, yeah, okay, we want to know how much uranium, but we also want to know how much uranium-238 is there, how much 235, how much 234, how much 236. All the different isotopes, which come and, well, at various timescales, come and go uh, because of radioactive decay. I mean, you know, Charlotte mentioned the neutrinoless double beta decay, and I had a little image of that. You know, the half-life, 10 to the 25 years, it's postulated. No one's ever measured it, right? So just to put that in context, uranium decay, which we all know about, that's how we make nuclear power and so forth. You know, the, the uranium decay is about four and a half billion years for its half-life. For the neutrinoless double beta decay, 10 to the 24, 10 to the 25 years is equivalent to around a quadrillion, quadrillion times the age of the universe. And that's what we're trying to measure. I mean, that's, that's like, <laughs> yeah. pretty mind blowing. Well, that is all the questions for now. So I want to thank you both again. Um, and yeah. I'm going to hand it back to Tony. OK, well, thank you, everybody, for that. And uh, thanks especially to Matt and Charlotte and, and for answering the questions. So now I'll turn over the mic uh, to Ben Tam. So Ben is one of our star graduate students in astroparticle physics. And when not solving the mysteries of the world and the universe and the nature of neutrinos, he's very passionate about uh, education and outreach. On a normal Ignite night, we would be showcasing a number of demos where we invite people to come in and show off their work and people to get a bit more hands-on. Of course, in a remote setting, that's difficult. So instead, uh, Ben has volunteered to try and capture some of that excitement by showing the cloud chamber from the visitor center at Queen's. So over to you, Ben. Thanks, Tony, and thanks for that uh, overly generous introduction. I, I don't know exactly what I owe you, but I, I'm sure there's something on the list that you're trying to weasel out of me. Uh, but here I am, hello everybody, from the uh, McDonald Institute Visitor Center here 
at Sterling Hall, home of the Department of Physics at Queen's University, where I am a uh, graduate student, like Tony said, and I'm one of the people that Matt and Charlotte were alluding to who go deep underground to build gigantic detectors, and my colleagues and I are trying to find things like neutrinoless double beta decay and dark matter and so on and so forth. So here is a, just a kind of an image of some of these detectors, 10 story tall, two kilometers underground. And so you can imagine that it's quite challenging to uh, build these gigant, gigantic detectors on the ground. Um, so why do we have to do that in the first place, right? The, the, bottom, the bottom line is why do we even have to go two kilometers underground? So we have here in the visitor center and hopefully something that you all can visit very soon is a little device that can help demonstrate exactly why that's necessary. So you can see that right there. That's what we call a cloud chamber. And basically what it's able to see are particles from space that are hitting it. So, uh, you know, space itself turns out it's not very empty as the earth hurtles around the sun and the sun hurtles around the Milky Way, we're actually running into many, many particles or from our perspective, we're stable. So we're being bombarded by many, many charged particles from you know, various uh, extra, extra solar and extra galactic sources. So what the cloud chamber does is allow you to see these otherwise invisible particles. Um, so you can, you know, if I zoom in right here and it's quite hard to see, uh, you can see those little streaks, and those streaks aren't an artifact of my kind of poor connection here. Those are real particles from outer space that you can see interacting with this cloud chamber. So how this cloud chamber works is it's basically a very good refrigerator. I mean, more of a freezer it goes down to about negative 30. And what we've done is we've poured in uh, what is, you know, cleaning alcohol. So alcohol, is, as many of you likely know, it evaporates very easily. So when we, you know, freeze, you know, when we bring the alcohol to very low temperature and a particle from outer space interacts with the alcohol, it can deposit small amounts of energy. So these small amounts of energy may be enough to knock off electrons from the alcohol, right? Or to basically evaporate the alcohol. And that's what these uh, streaks are. So again, these are particles sometimes from outside our galaxy, sometimes from, you know, all, storing, all, all sorts of different sources from all over the universe uh, coming to us right now and interacting with our, uh, with our cloud chamber right here. So again, these streaks, you can see that there's different patterns of streaks. These different patterns represent various different types of particles that hit it. They all leave a different signature trail. That's how, you know, in other particle experiments, you're able to identify exactly what you're seeing. And uh, unfortunately for us who, who work on these big uh, underground detectors, these kind of streaks, these are kind of the, uh, the things we don't wanna see. Um, they mimic the signal of dark matter and neutrinos. So what we find really effective to combat this is to basically build the detectors deep, deep underground and let the Earth's crust absorb as many of these as possible. And we find that works pretty effectively. Typically here, you'll get, you know, one of these larger streaks uh, on your, on your you know, thumbnail or so once every minute or so, where our experiment is, that's down to once every 30 or 40 years. So you can see that it's actually very, very effective. So if you still don't believe me, uh, I have this uh, little toy here. And by a toy, you can see I'm uh, starting to run into things to do in the pandemic. But this toy here is just a rock. So this rock has uh, certain amounts of um, the element thorium, specifically the isotope thorium-228. So thorium-228, it decays into radon gas. So it's uh, you know very harmless at the levels that we have here on the surface. We're, we're immersed in radon gas all the time. But what radon gas does is it, it further it further uh, decays away to other sorts of uh, to other isotopes, stuff like you know lead and polonium and bismuth and whatnot. So these decays always come with an energy signature, right? Always they also you know not only decay to a different particle, but you know, release high, uh, highly energetic charged particles. So what this rock, this thorium laced rock, has been doing in the syringe for some time now is decaying away and emitting radon gas. So radon gas by uh, insert the radon gas into the cloud chamber. So I'm just using the syringe. I'm going to insert the radon gas into the cloud chamber. You can see it's already immediately causing these particles, right? So you can see this is a real effect. This isn't some sort of screen or anything like that. And you can see all these different decays that are coming as a result of the radon being inserted into this cloud chamber here. What is, you know, effectively as our surface particle detector. So there you have it. This is a good demonstration of two of the uh, very 
annoying complications you have to deal with when dealing, you know, when looking for dark matter neutrinos. Not only do you have to worry about things coming from all around the universe, but you have to worry about the rocks and everything, everything around it themselves. So, so it's just some fun things to think about. Hopefully you can come see it yourself sometime in the very near future. And, uh, you know, if you actually get lonely and want to stare at the cloud chamber a little more, I've heard that this is a, uh, this cloud chamber in particular is streamed on Twitch. So maybe you can go check it out if you uh, just want some background particle decays to look at. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, thanks very much, Ben. That's great. Good to see that it's still working after all this time in the visitor center alone. And I think uh, another thing to point to, to the collaboration between physics and geology, I believe in the middle of the night, we snuck over there and chipped a piece off one of their rocks in their museum. And that's where we got that rock. <laughs> so. Uh, I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> So now it's my pleasure to introduce Ryan Martin. So Ryan's roots go back to an early life, which I believe began in Switzerland. And so we expect his talk to be on time, exactly on time. And uh, Ryan began his university career at Queen's University. He graduated from Queen's three times as an undergraduate. Then he got his MSc and finally a PhD, all in a decade between uh, 1999 and 2009. So then Ryan uh, finally realized there was life outside of Queens and he went to Lawrence Berkeley uh, National Laboratory just outside, uh, um, well, in Berkeley in, in California. And he was working there on a Majorana experiment, trying to understand more about the properties of neutrinos. Uh, he then got a, a professorship at the University of South Dakota in 2013. And we were finally able to lure him back to Canada and back to Queens in 2015 where he's a professor of physics. So uh, Ryan is in the field of astroparticle physics. He's got an interest in dark matter and neutrinos. He's also passionate about teaching. And I'm going to add that he most recently won the 2020 Teaching Excellence Award from the uh, Ontario Undergraduate Student Alliance, which is very impressive. I understand the students who just wrote his exam a couple of days ago may not be voting for him this year, but. Uh, I think we're in for a real treat this evening and Ryan will follow on to introduce Ashley, who's an undergraduate student in our physics department, who's been working with Ryan on research. And she's gonna explain, I believe, how this somewhat esoteric work is connected both to physics and COVID. So I'll pass it over to you, Ryan. So thank you very much for the introduction and, and for tuning in. Uh, let me bring up my slides. I believe it's thinking of that. There we go. Okay. Um, <clears throat> minimize. Uh, all right. So um, I chose a somewhat odd topic to tell you about, which is um, how we can use random numbers to understand the world around us. So at heart, I am a physics professor and my field, well, I call it particle astrophysics, even if everybody else tonight has called it astroparticle physics. The important thing about, I'll call it particle astrophysics is the two words in there. And so think about particle physics. Particle physics is the physics, the science of trying to understand the smallest constituents of matter, um, the particles that make up the world that we live in. Astrophysics, <clears throat> is the science or the physics of the largest bodies that we interact with, um, things that we see through our telescopes. And so particle astrophysics together is a branch of physics where we got to learn about the smallest parts of the world as well as the biggest parts of the world. And that's what I think is really cool. And so I wanna tell you a little bit about the, the science that I work uh, on. And then after that, uh, some of the tools. So one question we can ask ourselves in particle astrophysics is how does this big ball of matter that we have in our galactic neighborhood, how does it work? How does the sun shine? And so astrophysicists can come up with complicated models. The sun is fairly complicated. It's a big ball of gas that's trying to collapse into the center. It's held up by pressure from these nuclear fusion reactions. These nuclear fusion reactions obviously produce, lot, produce lots of heat and light. 
that's why we live. But they also produce a lot of particles um, in while these fusion reactions are happening. And one of those particles uh, that's produced is the neutrino. And these neutrinos are produced at the center of the sun, travel undisturbed all the way to the earth, and are a direct signature of the processes that are going inside the center of the sun, which we cannot see. However, we can build uh, big fancy detectors to detect these neutrinos and try to understand what's going on inside the sun. So this is a picture of the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory. It's built in Sudbury, Ontario. Uh, this experiment is, is now finished. Uh, but just there's a person there uh, in the top right to give you a, a sense of the scale of these experiments. So they're, they're not small experiments. Um, and on top of that, they're constructed two kilometers underground uh, to shield us from all this external radiation like uh, Ben was telling you about. So then we can do um, try to, to detect these neutrinos from the sun and, and try to learn something about the, the, the sun. And when we do that, it turns out we also learn something about the neutrino. We learn something fundamental about this neutrino particle, and that's that they have mass. And that's so fundamental that it's worthy of, of a Nobel Prize. And so in 2015, Art McDonald, who's a professor at Queens in physics, won the Nobel Prize for leading the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory experiment. So we learned that these neutrinos have mass, <clears throat> but we don't quite know how to include this mass of the neutrino into our theory of physics. Uh, up until this discovery, neutrinos were thought to have no mass. So one of the challenges is to put this neutrino mass into our theory of physics. And one of the ways that we could maybe do that is if the neutrino is its own antiparticle. Most particles have an antiparter partner. So we think of matter and antimatter. And there's a possibility for the neutrino to be its own antiparticle. And so now we're talking very heavy particle physics. And so the astrophysics part is, is sort of lost when we think about the neutrino and its mass. However, when we think about this neutrino perhaps being its own antiparticle to allow it to have mass, then it solves one of the other big problems that we have in physics. And so one of these problems that we have in physics is that the, the Big Bang theory um, stopped showing. Sorry, no, that's not the problem. The problem is that the theory of the Big Bang predicts that um, the Big Bang will have created as much matter as it created antimatter. But when we look in our telescopes through the universe and we look for these anti-people made of antimatter living in anti-worlds, we don't see any. So clearly the universe is populated with predominantly matter and not antimatter. And that's one of these big questions that perhaps the small particle that is a neutrino can help us answer. And so then again, you have this connection between the very small and the very big. I also want to talk a little bit about this, this notion of dark matter since it came up in Charlotte's talk. And it's also something that I'm interested in and very clearly particle astrophysics. So when we look at pictures of galaxies like this, um, most little blips of light are stars, right? So these are huge objects in the sky. If we look at the speed of the stars, uh, especially near the outer edges around here, and we look at how fast they're rotating around the galaxy, we find that they're going way too fast when we compare it to the matter that we see. If you count all the little stars, and you know, we can let somebody else do that, but people have counted all the stars and added up all the mass, you get nowhere near enough mass in the center of the galaxy to explain how fast the stars on the outside are rotating. And so then the conclusion is that, well, there must be another form of matter um, that we can't see. Um, so we'll just call it dark matter. And so just to, to give you a sense, this is not a, a small hypothesis. It looks like perhaps there's a little bit of dark matter. It looks like there's probably four or five times more dark matter than there is regular matter in the universe. So most of the matter in the universe is something that we don't know. And so then we ask ourselves, well, what is dark matter? It's obviously a popular name for naming dark beers, but it's also most likely a new form of matter. And that's very exciting to us physicists because that's something that we can go and discover. And so we build experiments in Snow Lab, for example, which is in Sudbury, two kilometers underground. And this is an example of one of these detectors trying to look for dark matter. It's the News G experiment. It's a big sphere here um, that's filled with gas and then the dark matter particles would interact in the gas and leave a signature. Um, Ashley later will tell you a little bit about the work that she's been doing um, to try and understand this News G detector. <clears throat> 
So hopefully I've convinced you that the science is actually really cool. And, and, and usually in these talks, we make them science talks and I could usually talk at length about all the fun science that I do. Instead, I decided to talk to you about the tools that we use uh, for science. And so we can think of two categories of tools. One is the hardware that we use. So on the left is one of these things called a germanium detector. And the other is the software and the analysis. We have to analyze the data that comes out of these detectors. The um, germanium detector on the left does not produce peer reviewed papers. We need teams of students to work on computers and analyze the voltages that are output by these detectors and all sorts of other numbers and come up with actual interpretations that tie us back into something about neutrinos or about dark matter. And so I specifically want to tell you about one of these tools that we use for data analysis, so computing, um, because I think it's actually pretty cool in itself. And so this tool that I'll tell you about is called the Monte Carlo method or the Monte Carlo simulation. It's named after the Monte Carlo Casino, which is the casino in the city of Monaco. So it's the most famous casino, presumably because that's where James Bond likes to go play. This uh, Monte Carlo method was originally developed by scientists, or at least it was refined by scientists working on the Manhattan Project. They were trying to understand how uh, neutrons can move about and fission uranium atoms, which then reduce creates more neutrons, fissioning more um, uranium atoms. And so obviously they can do silly things like make bombs with that or nuclear reactors. And it's all a very complicated process to try and follow around all these neutrons and have them interact. And there's some random aspects to it. And so when people tried to do these calculations for you know, the yield of the bombs or whatever, um, they just could not get it to work. And so they had to develop new computational tools so they can, they can make these designs work and understand what's going on. And the key insight was that they could use random numbers to try and calculate some of these uh, processes. And because they use random numbers in this method, they associated with casinos and then um, the most famous casino is the Monte Carlo Casino. So that's sort of the little history on the Monte Carlo method. So first I'll show you how we can use the Monte Carlo methods to um, model a, a fair, fairly famous mathematical problem that we usually give to our second and third year uh, students in math at the university. So it's called the random walk or the drunk walk. Um, and so the math problem is that you have this drunk person <clears throat> and they start at a lamppost and they're so drunk that they're, I guess maybe they're trying to go home or uh, I don't know what they're doing, they're just there and they stumble forward and they stumble backwards and they stumble forwards. And it's completely random whether they decide to stumble forwards or backwards. And then the question, the math question is, on average, how far do they end up from the lamppost? So you can think of, for example, taking a bunch of drunkards and putting them all at the lamppost and then waiting 10 minutes and then seeing where they all end up. And so the students, if they're in second or third year, should be able to figure out that that distribution of where the drunk people will end up is very well defined. It's defined by what's called a binomial distribution or in the limit of you wait long enough for the drunk people to walk around, it's called the normal distribution. So what you see in the, the, the purple lines is the proportion of people that end up at a certain distance from the lamppost. So most of the people end up back at the lamppost because they've taken enough, the same number of steps forwards as they've, ta as they've taken backwards. Then a few of them end up sort of close to the lamppost because they did a few more steps forwards than they did backwards or the other way around. And as you get further and further from the lamppost, you get less and less drunk people. So even though it's a random process, these people randomly walking forwards and backwards, you end up with a very clearly defined and mathematically very well-defined function in this case, this blue line, which is called the normal distribution. So I wanted to show you uh, an illustration of a, of a calculator of sorts that um, can use randomness to determine uh, what this function should look like. And so this is called the Galton board. So I'll start the video. <clears throat> and so what goes on in the Galton board is you have these little marbles that are poured in through the top and then they can hit a peg and then they'll go left or right, and they can hit another peg, and then go left or right, and they can hit another peg and go left and right, and so forth. And then at the end, they end up in these different bins. 
So it's very much like the drunk walk, right? So the drunk person can go left or right, they can go left or right, and then the middle is the lamppost, and then further on, uh, they have different chances to go. Um, I think I will speed this up. And it takes a little while, but you can see that the little marbles are ending up in the positions that are described by this normal distribution. And I'll just go all the way to the end, or there we are, almost there. And it's almost as exact. And of course, for it to be exact, you would have to wait for an infinite amount of time, and then it would be exact. Oops. So this normal distribution um, describes a large number of things in nature, including the, the scores on SAT exams. Um, if you measure the, the length of the wings of the flies that you catch in your house, most of them will have a length of 44 to 48 millimeters and then less and less for the other lengths. Um, an interesting example of the normal distribution, if you look at how worn out the weights are at the gym, you can find the most popular weights and you'll find that the there's less and less people that can deal with the super heavy or the super light weights. <clears throat> so this Galton board is an example in a way of a Monte Carlo simulation. Uh, what we do is we make Monte Galton boards that are a little bit more complicated. So you can think of instead of having just a peg where the ball could bounce left or right, we could have this little arrangement of platforms so that there's different probabilities for the ball to end up all the way to the left or in the middle or on the right. And so I think I have now enough uh, introduction for you um, to show you how we can do a Monte Carlo simulation of a seemingly simple problem that's not so hard, that's not so easy to do uh, if you try to do it mathematically. So imagine that you have a burger restaurant um, and you'd like to know how much money you make on average or uh, the distribution of the profits that you make every day. So you have some inputs that you know about your burger restaurant you know that there's an average number of customers every day that's between 20 and 30. That's something you can easily measure. Then you look at uh, the three burgers that you sell. Um, you can see which ones are, are, are more popular on the menu. And so you know that 20% of people order the mystery burger, 50% the veggie burger, and 30% the regular burger. And then you also know how much profit you make from each of these burgers. The mystery burger, you make $5 because that's roadkill and you, you don't have to spend any money. Veggie burger, you make only $3, and the regular burger, you make only $2. So how do I try to figure out how much money do I make in a day? And each day is random, right? Because every day you have a different number of customers that come in. And so to simulate one day of my burger restaurant, the first thing I do is I choose a number of customers. So I choose a number of marbles between 20 and 30. Let's say I choose 25 for that day. Then I drop my marbles down my modified Galton board so it doesn't have the same probabilities. In fact, I've set it up so that there's 20% um, chance to end up in the mystery burger pile, 50% in the veggie burger, and 30% uh, or whatever it is in the regular burger. And so then you drop all your marbles for that day, and then you can count how many burgers were ordered for that day, and you can add those together, and then you know the profit for that day, and then you can do that again. So I don't usually make my grad students or my undergrad students even build uh, Galton boards because that, that's way too time consuming, not very useful. So in practice, we do this on a computer, of course. So in a computer, we can ask a computer to generate a random number for us. And so the way we would simulate this aspect of choosing the mystery veggie regular burger is we would ask the computer to generate a random number for us that's between zero and 100. And if that number is less than 20, which will happen 20% of the time, right? 20% of the numbers between zero and 100 are less than 20, then we'll associate that with the mystery burger choice. If it's between 20 and 70, which is 50% of the time, then we'll say it's a veggie burger. And if it's bigger than 70, we'll say it's a regular burger. And so now you actually know enough, which is something I would not normally even do in a, in a technical talk, so let alone to the, to the general public, but I'll actually show you some computer code because I think you can understand it. And so this is actual computer code. It's written in the, in the computing language called Python of the simulation of the restaurant. And so my first step here is to ask the computer, generate a random number between 20 or 30, and that'll be my number of customers. And then for each of those customers, I asked the computer to generate me a random number between zero and 100. 
And I'll call that choice. And if that number is less than 20, then I add the profit of the mystery burger. If it's between 20 and 70, the profit of the veggie burger. And if it's um, bigger than 70, then it, I add the profit of the regular burger. <clears throat> this is just some of the outputs uh, of this computer program. I wrote it yesterday, it took three minutes. Um, and so for example, you see on day two, it chose 26 customers and they ordered six mystery burgers, 11 veggie and nine regular for a profit of $81. Now, for previous day, 28 customers, $85. Uh, day three, 24 customers, $71. And you can see that these are all random numbers, right? There's no real pattern, except that on average, you'll get 20% mystery, 50% veggie, and 30% regular. And so at the end of this, you can tabulate and you can run it. So here I ran this exact simulation for 10,000 days of my restaurant. And so I can figure out that the average daily profit is $76, but that's not so easy to figure out from the inputs. And you can, of course, use this to make uh, business decisions. You can say, well, it's very unlikely. There are very few days where my restaurant makes less than $60. There's quite a few days where it makes more than $90 profit. And then you can try and fine tune the price of the burgers, et cetera, to optimize how you, you would run your business. So that's at the end of my talk. Um, I tried to focus uh, very much on this Monte Carlo method um, so that Ashley uh, will be able to tell you um, how she's used the Monte Carlo method to go back and do some physics and then also some modeling of COVID-19. So it's my pleasure to introduce um, Ashley uh, Makuda, who is one of our third year uh, physics students. Uh, she worked with me uh, over last summer and continues to work with me uh, through the school year. So I believe I've stopped sharing. And I'll leave it to you, Ashley. Yep, um, let me just share my screen. Okay, are we good? Okay, awesome. Okay, so um, I just like to say hi. Um, I'm Ashley Makita, and I'm in my third year of my undergrad degree at Queens, and I'm majoring in physics. And I had the opportunity to work for Professor Ryan Martin this summer. And I'm going to focus my talk on the Monte Carlo method and two applications that we used it with this summer. And the first I'm going to talk about is scattered neutrons. So why did we study scattered neutrons? So um, we expect that the signal that we get from scattered neutrons will look like the signal that we would detect from scattered dark matter. So we did an experiment with a beam of neutrons and interacted it with um, particles of a gas. In this case, we use neon within a detector. And when the neutron interacts with a particle um, such as a such as neon, we'll see a scattered neutron come out and we can detect the signal in another detector. Um, and hopefully this will help us better understand dark matter. So this summer we worked with a collaboration called News G, which had this exact same experimental setup. So the neutron beam is behind this sphere and it's a metallic sphere that's filled with gas. And then there's this large structure here that has eight individual detectors that are used to detect the scattered neutrons. And these scattered neutrons are very dependent on the angle that the neutrons scatter at, so um, which is the scattering angle. And I first used the Monte Carlo method to um, generate the scattering angle randomly, but I chose the scattering angle and I chose an average of, in this example, 29 degrees, and I used random numbers to get a distribution with a mean of 29 degrees. And um, we hope to reproduce what, what we would expect to see in an actual experiment. So first I did this by randomly generating um, neutron interactions just by picking random numbers uh, for X, Y, and Z coordinates. And this gave me a cube 
But since we want to um, model neutron interactions within the sphere, I narrowed it down to the sphere, but we'll only see the interactions where the neutron beam goes into the sphere with the gas particles. So we again narrowed it down to um, just be almost in only the bottom half. And each point here actually represents one interaction with a neutron and a particle of gas. Then using the Monte Carlo method again, very similar to how we did it with um, creating the interaction in the sphere, I randomly chose a new set of X, Y, and Z coordinates um, that all have the same probability of being uh, picking random positions. And I could um, model again, it looks like a cube, and then I narrowed it down to find an interaction or a scattered neutron just within the width of the detector and then to only be in the position of a detector. So this allowed me to model, um, to use the Monte Carlo method to randomly choose the scattering angle and then to randomly pick a neutron, um, or sorry, a neutron interaction in the sphere, which I, you can see is like a white dot here and each neutron interaction has a corresponding um, scattered neutron in another, in one of the detectors. And then this is the scattering angle is the angle between the two. Um, and we can actually see that um, with our simulated data, um, we could get very close to um, real data found in the lab. So you can see that the Monte Carlo method gives us a very accurate and um, representation of what we should find in the lab. And it shows the power that the Monte Carlo method has. And since we were able to develop these Monte Carlo simulations um, with very complex concepts, we thought that we could use these skills and apply them to trying to model COVID. So uh, before I get into the model that we built this summer, I thought I would briefly go through the two major models that are being used right now to model COVID. The first one is an SIR model. So that stands for susceptible, um, infected and recovered. And these models are focused on rates. So they have a constant rate um, that, so they start with like a, a population and then there's a constant rate that people are infected, a constant rate of asymptomatic and mild people um, and so on. And then the other model is agent-based. And this is based on individual people and it's um, a better representation of the real world. So this is the model we chose to use. And you can see here that it um, better models interactions between each individual person. So agent-based models, um, you build individual people and they have an environment and they have set. So this environment is set properties that are unique to them. So for example, an age and a job. And then we run the simulation with changing parameters for each day and see what the output is and who gets infected. So our model specifically, um, first we modeled each person. So since each person has a unique, um, has unique um, properties, we modeled one person at a time. So we used the Monte Carlo method and gave people a random age, for example. And this ties back to the burger example, how we pick our age. So although it's not completely random, we used, um, since we know that um, we, have a, we have distributions of real populations, we can say if approximately 10% of people are between zero and 10, then we can use that to our age group and we can pick random numbers so that 10% of our population is also between zero and 10. Um, and then we repeat this process with jobs, household size, is isolation tendencies, health status, and so on. And this gives us each person with a unique property in each category. And then we throw all of these people together in a population. Then we can model um, how they interact. So now that we have the population, we can really simulate what we would expect to happen in person. So initially um, we infect 10 people and each day there's, they have a probability of infecting another person that they come into contact with. And this is based on the interactions that they have and the interaction sites that they go to. So in our specific model, we made three types of interaction sites. 
So the first one is somewhere that you would go every single day and you come into contact with this, mostly the same people. So this is somewhere that you work, for example. Um, our second type of interaction class is somewhere that you visit often and you see some of the same people, but not, but you don't go there every day. So this is like a grocery store. And our last interaction site is somewhere that you go occasionally, um, but there's lots of different people there that you haven't come into contact with, like a restaurant. Um, and each interaction site that you go to, if someone is infected, then they have a random probability of infecting someone. Then the next day, this all resets and anyone who is still infected gets a new probability of infecting other people. And this then repeats every day for the rest of the simulation. So this is an output of uh, um, one simulation that we ran the Monte Carlo COVID simulation for. And this specific one was with 10,000 people. And you can see that this isn't great and that um, there's not very many protective measures and people probably aren't wearing masks and social distancing since the most of the population gets infected. But you can also see that it makes sense since the number of susceptible people, which is this red line, um, goes down as the pandemic, um, as the days pass. And, the, um, and that makes sense because most people are already infected or they've recovered, so there's less people to infect. And I just like to note that we are still working on developing this model. Um, it's still a work in progress and Currently, we're working on implementing and developing our model of masks and social distancing, and we're working on specifically model using this model to model the spread of COVID in Kingston. And we plan on working with public health once we get our model to a point that we're happy with. And in conclusion, I'd just like to say that the Monte Carlo method leads to a wide variety of things, and we can use it in our everyday life. Um, it can be used in, from scattering neutrons to understanding COVID. And although it may seem as simple as just using random numbers, it can be used to reproduce many very complex concepts. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Ashley and Ryan. A uh, number of questions were put in the chat uh, for both of you. Um, let me just try to pull them up. So this is so fascinating to hear about like casinos, James Bond, COVID and burgers. Like uh, this is my, well, except for one of those things, this is uh, my jam. Um, so one was from Nikhil, which was asking about for the news G experiment, does anybody know why the neon gas was chosen specifically? Yeah, I can comment on that. Well, um, if you think of your periodic table of elements, neon is in a specific column. Um, that column is the noble gases. And so it's, uh, it's an element that doesn't do much chemistry. Um, and so we don't have to worry about a lot of things uh, that could happen in the gas. The, we don't worry too much about the neon atoms collecting and interacting with each other and forming molecules and doing all sorts of things we don't want to have to account for. Uh, that would be the main reason. Yeah, and I should give Nick Nikhil credit. He did follow up with that. Is it because it's inert, which it sounds like is indeed the, the answer. Good question, uh, self-answer. Another question was, um, how, how did you guys realize that you could apply MC, like Monte Carlo methods to something as outside of astroparticle physics as COVID modeling? Who had that yeah. idea? I'm happy to talk about that. That's, um... There's a bit of a historical aspect to it in that um, I just got a bunch of money last summer to expand my lab. Um, and I'd finally bought all this stuff for the summer 2020 it was gonna be my big summer of research. And back in February, 2020, I hired a, a large number of undergraduates. So February, 2020, you can see the timing there, not optimal. <clears throat> and so then comes May, we're in lockdown and I have a team of uh, four undergraduates, I believe, and four grad students and a postdoc and no lab access. And so we thought, well, what are things that we can do, first of all, to you know, help us understand this pandemic? I mean, there's a, there's a psychological aspect of trying to understand what's going on. And also, what is something we can do 
that um, will develop skills uh, for our undergraduate students, especially um, that are relevant uh, in physics, but with a change of scenery. And so we decided to do this COVID-19 modeling project because it uses a lot of the same techniques. And you know, we had the arrogance to believe that we maybe bring a, a fresh new perspective to uh, epidemiology as, as particle astrophysicists, right? And so that's sort of all the context. It was the same math tools. Um, it was just, you know, the thing to help change our minds, a way to educate the, the students in, in a number of techniques. Um, and then it turns out the, these undergrads did a, a really nice job um, understanding modeling efforts in the world um, and, and highlighting that the, the the choice that we made to use the Monte Carlo is actually a good choice that, that very few people are actually using. And we found that there's a lot of models that are um, of questionable scientific value, I would say. And that's all work that was done by the undergrads to figure all this out. So I hope that was, that rant at least answered the question. <laughs> and Ashley, I'm wondering about that, like you're, you were one of these undergrads and so in your talk was really interesting and I'm like, were you surprised when you started to like have to look at both those modeling information and also maybe looking at the information that goes into the COVID, to the, the COVID models itself? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I was extremely lucky that I, I still got to work this summer for Professor Ryan. Um, and it, it was definitely like, they seemed like very different, but it was really cool to get to work on COVID. And it was kind of cool because every week we would all come together and like, something new would be found out about COVID and then we would try and apply that to our model. Um, and there was so much information being put out. So we got to, like, I've never really learned about a pandemic or I guess I've never been through one either. So it was definitely cool to use something that I could actually apply to like my everyday life. Um, yeah, so it was pretty cool to learn about. And I mean, we're still doing it um, every week. So we're still learning a lot now. Hmm. I'll just also highlight that the undergraduates in the group led by Ashley um, applied for a grant from the Faculty of Arts and Science and actually managed to obtain funding uh, to work wow. on this project for next semester. So that's well, congratulations cool. to all of you. There was a question from Rob in the chat, which was kind of about this, these scientific models for COVID modeling, which he says that I always worry about these epidemiological models. How can you check that your model reflects reality? And I think he compares it for the neutron detector model. You actually were able to go in and, and confirm that your model agreed with the data. So is there a way to do that for the COVID models? It's tricky. Um, and maybe I'll, I'll step back a little bit um, because I gave these lectures to the, to the students. But when we started, um, what's the point of the model, right? Um, is it to make predictions about the future? And I would argue that's not a very scientific thing, right? That's a, actually a big no-no in science is extrapolation, right? We don't, just because we know the data here, we should not talk about the data there unless we know about it, right? This is not magic, it's science. It's, we collect data and facts and that's all we can talk about. The other aspect of, so people think of COVID modeling as making predictions to hospitals and blah, 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 and things like that. But that's not so much what we're, we were interested in. Um, it's more like what Rob was saying that we want to compare um, data that we can collect. So we can look at the data from Kingston, for example, the number of new cases per day. Um, and we can look at that from many different places at once. And then our model will, 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 will create these curves, right? Of how many people are infected each day. And you know they'll have different slopes, the peak will be shifted, et cetera. And so by comparing that to a lot of different um, regions uh, and data from those regions, we can start to understand the parameters that go into the model because that's really what we're trying to determine. It's those percentages. Um, what fraction of the people really are um, dying, right? Um, it's actually not so easy to determine the, the death rate from COVID, right? Because you don't know the denominator. You know this many people die, but you don't know how many people actually had COVID, right? Because there's so many asymptomatic cases. However, those curves through all the different countries and the different regions, um, they all depend on that information. And so if you can reproduce all those different curves, then you start getting a better sense of what those parameters are in the model, like, you know, the death uh, uh, ratio, whatever it's called, um, would be an obvious one, but there's all sorts of other parameters like the incubation period, et cetera, uh, that we try to fit out. And so we think of this like physicists, we, we have these data and we have a model that we try to, to use to describe those data. 
And then we try to extract parameters of the model by looking at the, those data, more so than trying to make predictions about the future. There was a question near the beginning of your talk, Ryan, about like what did the random num using random numbers, using the Monte Carlo method, what did that overcome, particularly in that nuclear explosion calculation? <laughs> um, so it'll, uh, I'll refer to the Wikipedia entry on the Monte Carlo method. It actually has a pretty good uh, history of it. But they knew some of the properties of the neutrons, like some of the cross section, the probability for neutrons to do specific things. And when they put, put those numbers into the, to some uh, models, so not Monte Carlo based, they, they were getting numbers that or answers that were completely wrong and not at all describing reality. Um, the Monte Carlo method in itself using random numbers, like the Galton board actually is a fairly ancient idea, but to, to do it sort of like a, with high, high efficient, uh, uh, what do we call it? Uh, big computers, et cetera. Uh, that's the sort of a modern development that really comes from the Manhattan Project. But ultimately they had to calculate a lot of complicated things. Uh, and we use it all the time. There's another question about, um, like, are you able, in, in some of these models, are you able to predict, like, do, do you kind of have an idea of what the Monte Carlo models are going to give you? Like, for that burger example, do you have a rough idea, like, is some of that work able to be done through calculations, or is really, like, the Monte Carlo method the, the best or fastest, or I don't know what metrics make it particularly good to use? So usually we use it because we can't. Uh, calculate the things. Um, when we write a Monte Carlo simulation for a specific physics experiment, we, of course, we don't just trust the results of the random numbers. So the way we sort of calibrate it and embed it, uh, if you like, is that we do similar experiments um, where we know what the result should be. And then we look if that result is what the Monte Carlo says it should be. And then we know the difference between the Monte Carlo prediction and reality. And then we hope that that difference, <laughs> when we extrapolate it, <laughs> to use the word that's a no-no, uh, when, we, when we do it for the actual experiments, um, we expect that those changes are, are small. Uh, but it ends up being a systematic, what we call a systematic uncertainty in our predictions. So our, our Monte Carlo predictions, when we do things properly in physics, they also have errors to them. So we don't just predict the curve. We predict the curve with a band around it. And we say the curve is probably somewhere in between here, the high degree of confidence. So there was a comment in the in the chat that I thought is worth highlighting from uh, A. P. Pedersen. This is just saying that this this work is a really cool example of showing how astroparticle physics uh, can be kind of mobilized to address timely problems. And so, just a congratulations to you, Ryan, and your team and, and the undergrads and Ashley. Well, actually, um, I'll, so I'll I'll, I'll uh, <laughs> expand yeah. on that, right? Because um, well, first of all, we're arrogant as a physicist. We think we can do everything better than everybody else. We're super smart. Um, but there's a much bigger effort that was done uh, by particle astrophysicists uh, to code the, in, in, in the context of COVID. And that's this development of the, uh, the mechanical, the Milano mechanical uh, ventilator. Um, so one of our, uh, our colleagues uh, in Italy, or he's Italian, but he's, he works in Princeton. He uh, well, saw how things were going uh, at home uh, in, you know, in March. And he gathered together a large team of uh, astral particle physicists, including Tony Noble, who's the host for tonight, uh, to develop a, a cheap uh, ventilator that could be used and made from uh, parts that are available anywhere in the world. And so it was an, an open source design of a ventilator to try and again solve uh, problems related to this pandemic. So I should highlight them as a much <laughs> more valiant effort. <laughs> I'm wondering if there's any, I see no more questions, I think, in the chat, although feel free, viewers, to, to put one in. But if there's any other questions from, for any of our speakers today, maybe from any of the other speakers. I don't know if there's any conversation that wants to happen here. I see that everybody's still on the line, so I just want to encourage that. Um, but otherwise, if there isn't, then um, maybe I'll just welcome Tony back. I'll mention the, <clears throat> I feel like I'm doing all the talking, but the, uh, this link between geology and particle astrophysics is, um, is, is really cool. Um, we mentioned this thing called neutrino double beta decay earlier, um, but we didn't really explain what it was. Maybe you remember I was talking about people and anti-people, uh, that the matter and antimatter in the universe, there's this imbalance somehow. 
one of the experiments we're trying to do to detect, um, to understand whether the neutrino could be the, the, the source of this is to look for a radioactive decay um, that, you know, would imply that the neutrinos are their own antiparticle. And that radioactive decay, kind of like what Matt was saying earlier, when we try to do dark matter, either we build large experiments with a lot of dark, uh, target material for the dark matter to interact with, or we can look at something uh, that's been there for a long time and to see if it's decayed. And so the first observations of uh, double beta decay, so it's not the neutrino list kind that implies the, the anti-neutrino, but it's another radioactive decay that also has half-lives of the order of 10 to the 20 years, so a lot more than the age of the universe. The first observations of that was actually in geology by looking for isotopes that shouldn't exist in rocks, because the only way those isotopes could exist in rocks is through double beta decay. Maybe Matt will correct me if I'm totally wrong on this, but um, I think that's a, that's a really neat thing that I did not know in my original uh, physics education, that the, the first detection of the thing that I work on was actually by geologists. Cool. And I hear there is one more question, maybe from one of the people behind the screens. Zach is the communications officer at the McDonald Institute. And he says, what's up with the dip in the middle of the normal distribution? I think this might be from the Galton box. Is that, where did this appear, Zach? Okay, so the 10,000 one would not be a normal distribution because the, <laughs> Um, so, so ultimately, okay, right. So um, uh, Zach was asking why the, the normal distribution that came out of the Galton board and of uh, my simulation of the burger restaurant uh, weren't perfectly smooth, if I paraphrase correctly the question. <clears throat> um, so the reason that is, is because the Monte Carlo method involves these random numbers. And so the only time you'll get a smooth, perfectly smooth distribution. So is if you run it for an infinite number of days. So you have to drop an infinite number of marbles in the Galton board to get an actually perfectly smooth uh, normal distribution, just like you'd have to simulate, you know, an infinite number of days in the restaurant. In practice, uh, you don't need to simulate that many to get a pretty smooth looking thing uh, that's within the uncertainties that you can know. So usually in practice, you never would, well, of course you in practice, you cannot do an infinite number of times, but you don't even need to do it close to an infinite number of times because you have other uncertainties in your input that are bigger than the differences that you have in your output between the output and the perfectly smooth curve. Oh, that was... Thanks. I wish I wish I could have an infinity number of burgers, but I think there's <laughs> lots of reasons why that's not a good idea, but too bad. I think uh, one of the people in chat actually suggested approximating that in, in their own <laughs> dieting habits. But I had a question for Ashley, which was, how do you deal with the super spreader events, you know, that aren't modeled in the things that you talked about, but seem to be very important events in the life of COVID, where uh, suddenly you get to an event that brings a lot of people together, perhaps unwisely, and suddenly you get a huge spread. And that didn't seem to be one of the things in your model. Um, sorry, I'm not 100% sure I understand your question. Well, uh, you talked about sort of people interacting and they might go to a restaurant, which happens with a certain frequency and so on. But if you end up with, uh, I don't know, uh, an event where suddenly 100,000 people march downtown to protest something completely unexpectedly, you know, maybe a shooting or something. And now you have 100,000 people all in one spot. And that's going to dra potentially dramatically change the course of uh, the, uh, you know, the passing of the infection. And I wonder, you know, is there enough statistics now to know how often you might have a quote super spreader event and therefore can put it into your model? Um, right, okay, so thank you for clarifying. Um, potentially that definitely could be something we could add. Um, like I said, we have, currently we have three different interaction sites. Um, so we could add like a fourth one that happens very rarely to try and simulate that. Um, Right now, um, those interaction sites aren't based on um, current data. That's something we're working on improving right now. Um, but there probably is enough data online right now. We just have to 
find it. Um, but that definitely should be something we should be including in our model. Cool. So then, Tony, I think I'm going to throw it back to you. OK, well, that's too bad, because that means that <laughs> things are over for the night, more or less. But I thought it was a fascinating set of talks, and I'm always amazed uh, by when we bring people together from these sort of cross-disciplinary areas, how much we have in common and how much we enjoy, uh, you know, interacting and discussing the research and how there's there's so much overlap in the things we do. And uh, one of the programs that we're putting on now at the McDonald Institute is this cross-disciplinary internship where we have people who are sort of uh, working in geology now going to work on dark matter. We have people who are in uh, biomedical areas proposing to work in geology, uh, you name it. There's uh, all kinds of interesting ideas out there. And it's really uh, uh, inspiring, I think, to see these things and to just hear all the different research that's happening across Queens and, and how that's impacting people's daily lives. Uh, we're not all cone heads in our offices and labs doing esoteric research, but it has real world implications. And um, so I'm hoping that people will uh, join us on other nights for Ignite, where we would bring a different cast of characters every time and talk about some of the exciting research that's happening around Queens, uh, why it's important, uh, how you might engage and uh, just uh, learn and, uh, and participate. So. At that, uh, Mark, I think I'll, I'll bring the, uh, the, the sessions to an end and we should be advertising soon for, for the next round. So thanks everybody for attending. Yeah, 